Hello. Very quickly, I want to address uh, something that that may may you may have, may not have noticed yet. Uh, you're watching or listening list list watching to episode four of the podcast. The last podcast I shared on YouTube was episode one, so I know what you're probably thinking, uh, James. He can't count. Uh, how are we gonna tell him? We gotta tell him. We have to tell him what are you know. We gotta be his friend. It's gonna be tough. No, I, you don't have to do that. It's okay. I can count. The reason I'm doing this is because episode two and three, if you're subscribed to the podcast, is uh, actually f- content from conversations that I had recently with two different photographers, and therefore they don't need to be posted again, or that would be wildly redundant. So. That's why we're on episode four. With that said, here's episode four. Gear talk. Whoa, hey, how's it going? Welcome back to another uh, Red Photo Podcast. This is episode four. Four. And today I, I want to have a conversation uh, or, <laughs> or a monologue about hmm, gear misconceptions. And uh, just, I guess, I guess, interesting ways we talk about gear and how we can more efficiently talk about gear. Uh, I am somebody who, when I think about gear, I look at them as a tool, and I'm, I'm rather minimalistic with my gear. I don't really, I, I, I'm really rarely looking at cameras and uh, gear and and lenses, straps this and that. Maybe if I had a little more money, I would, but I just, I don't see it as a necessity for me. I love, I love the novelty of minimalism, right? And so I, I get frustrated a little bit with certain ways that, that, that cameras are spoken about, but I also just Overall, just think we could tweak our language. It's not necessarily good or bad in in many respects, but we could tweak our language. But what I do get mad at, holy crap, is QVC. (laughs) You ever watch QVC and watch them try to sell a camera to all the the 50-year-old grandmothers and moms trying to take pictures of their kids and what have you? They get on there and they're... They get on there and they're all... This this Canon T sixteen I can has has its face detection. This will make your photos as good as the pros. You can autofocus on anything. A, if a bird flies by, you don't even have to be pointing the camera at the bird. It will take a photo, a burst of the bird. Twenty four photos per. Per a quarter of a second of this bird, and you can choose and be just like the pros. And I'm watching that. And for, for one, I go this this for, uh, this this guy from Minnesota who wants to take picture, who wants to bird watch. He's he's 85 years old. And he wants to bird watch. He doesn't need a DSLR. He might need a DSLR. I guess if he wants the long lenses. All right, let's go with Soccer Mom. Soccer Mom doesn't need a DSLR. It's a, it's ginormous for one. They're they're buying this thing brand new. And oh, I, I forgot that about the deals. I'm sorry. QVC, obviously king king of deals. Um, yeah, you <laughs> they don't need they don't need a DSLR because it's such a a large camera and. For whatever reason, that's the forefront of what we're trying to sell people, and I think that it's marketing on the looks of the camera more so than the functionality of the camera and what it provides to somebody. So you look at something like a, uh, I recently recommended a Sony A6000. This camera is eh, a couple of years old now, and it's a fantastic little camera, and it does every single thing. Thing that the new that the Canon T fifty seven I does. <clears throat> uh, it's a little bit old school to think that 
that a casual photographer really needs a DSLR. Be, I mean, you it's fine. Like if you want it, whatever. I mean, you know, it's it's if you're a competent human being with arms that hold things <laughs> and can lift objects, then you're not going to break your back with the camera. That's cool. But we I think we're doing them a disservice when we're saying, here's this, you know, um here's this micro four thirds camera that is that is l less than half the size of this thing and you can go pick up a lens put it on the front of it zoom in on your kids and capture them shooting their soccer game and and it looks it looks just as good and you're happier it's easier to carry around but we're stuck with DSLRs and i think that it seems to be because of the marketing um the marketing appeal of them. So <clears throat> it's hard to get frustrated about these things, though, because really you could pick, I mean, nobody's dying. You can pick out any camera you want. You do what you want, right? But I, I, I want to serve people with how I talk about cameras, and I want to serve them the best way I know how to. So QVC, S suck my pinky. Um, okay, so... My earbuds are freaking out right now. I hope you guys can't hear that on the podcast. It's weird. Anyway, uh, so so I want to talk about I want to talk about first off megapixel count. We just came out of this this weird era of of <laughs> of me megapixels being everything ever. Like <clears throat> like we were not gonna stop until. The we had the Hubble Space Telescope in our pockets. That was what we were going after. And this whole time I'm just I'm I'm I that that's something that uh that I wish we would be a little a little bit more educated about because uh, megapixel you can, once you get past like I would be happy to shoot with a twelve megapixel camera. Period. Like I I would be I would be totally happy. I love that my phone uh, still has a, a low megapixel count in comparison to what did we get up to like fifty megapixels with that? I think it was Samsung, and there's no need for that unless you're tr unless you're printing a nine foot tall uh, aluminized print of your your you laying on a leopard rug above your fireplace, or if this is going in some sort of large magazine. Or what have you, but almost anything else you you really you really don't need it. It's nice to crop, but you you just don't i mean the 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 images are so are are so high quality on their own, especially if you're shooting raw that it's good to have some cropping room but re really like if you're <laughs> if you're relying on being able to crop in on a tenth of an image you're you we need to reevaluate because your photos are not going to come out that that appealing. So, uh, I th I think it's kind of a myth that you can just take a photo of everything and then crop in on it and make this beautiful thing. There's, you know, th there are a lot of different factors that come into play that make that argument not really that valid. So, megapixels, <clears throat> honestly, I don't at this point don't worry about them uh, too much. It's it's actually hard to find a camera if you unless you go back five years in the uh in the conveyor belt of camera creation you're not going to really find anything that doesn't have enough megapixels for what you're trying to do uh if you need more than what most cameras are going to offer it's going to be a niche it's, it's going to be it's going to be you're trying to shoot um landscapes that you're trying to sell to the marriott so that they can put it in their lobby you know, a, a, a 94 foot print. <laughs> That's when you can use the, uh, the 50, 60, uh, 94 Hubble telescope. So there's that. Uh, the other thing is we put, we put enormous emphasis on body. Uh, like my, <laughs> like, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, <sighs> hmm. we put enormous emphasis on camera bodies. And I would say that the camera body is something that you should spend maybe 30% of your effort on. <clears throat> the rest should go to lenses. I think that 
if you can get a body with decent low light performance, which is every camera body that's out at the moment, pretty much, and you can get um, you can you can get a oh one that will that will snap photos at a decent rate, which is also pretty much every um, camera. So so you have something like I I, use, <laughs> I shot with a D fifty for a very long time. And that camera would lock up on me after like four shots, and that was frustrating. So I found I upgraded to my D six hundred, and it was a whole new world for me. That's a big deal. That's a, that's an issue that comes with the body. But I've always said that you want to get a decent body. If, if anybody asks me what should I buy when it comes to gear, you want to get a <clears throat> you want to get a decent body, and put a good piece of glass on the front of it, like a like a window pane put it on the front, glue it to the camera, and then you're set, man. Freaking Ansel Adams, rock and roll, selling prints, changing the world, going to things in limos, that window pane. You you want... <laughs> so uh, one thing that 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 is a competitive uh, thing in, in camera bodies right now is image stabilization, in-body image stabilization. This is an interesting thing. Uh, the, the, uh, so the Olympus, uh, the new Olympus EM-10 uh, Mark II is a good example of this done very well. From what I understand, if you have a steady hand, you can actually handheld the camera and shoot at a second long shutter speed, which is, which is nuts. That's amazing. That's amazing. And um, I had somebody ask me about this, and the, the comment said, he said, what do you think about the OMD and T 10 Mark II from Olympus? I've read it's great for street photography because of its IBIS, uh, in-body image stabilization, or internal belly button <laughs> alliteration sequence. Very, very complex technical um, piece of computer software. So, and the, uh, okay, so where was it? Sorry. It's, it's IBIS and the M43 lenses are good qual. Oh, wait, hold on. I've read it's great for street photography because of its IBIS and the M43 lenses are good quality and more affordable than Sony lenses. I was making a video saying that the A600 was, a, was the best, most affordable camera for street photography right now. And I, I, uh, so I said, for one, I said that the, the lenses seem to kind of be in the same ballpark, at least on the lower end prime lenses. And, and so I said in, in my limited research, it doesn't seem like there's much of a price difference between Sony and Olympus, Olympus, <laughs> Olympus, on uh, at least lower end prime lenses. Both seem to be almost identical in price. One of the biggest winning points I see in choosing Olympus in terms of lenses is the fact that M43 is a universal lens mount, which opens you up to every M43 lens you can get your hands on. I enjoy that. Um, and then I said, the biggest difference, I see, and this is very intriguing to me, the biggest difference I see between the Olympus and an A600, uh, A6000, for example, Sony A6000, is the sensor size. So the Olympus camera, the EM10, has a, a micro four-thirds sensor, which if you don't know, that's essentially, you have a sensor that's about half the size. Let me rephrase. If you put a lens on the front of an Olympus camera, or a, any camera with a micro four-thirds sensor, you're going to crop that lens in double what, the, what a full-frame sensor would do obviously with no cropping and so i said um i said uh, m43 is not necessarily worse than aps-c it's just a different image in the end a m43 can't be an aps-c and an aps-c can't be a full frame i said that's up to preference but it's nice to know the difference and <clears throat> this is um this is a this is a this is an interesting way that I'm talking about sensor size. And the reason I say that is because I don't think I, I don't think 
uh, I think there is a lot of talk around sensor size, and it tends to be of better or worse. It's, uh, micro Four Thirds is obviously worse than full frame because it's come on, it's full frame. Uh, in that case, uh, we should all start working on going to medium format because obviously that's the. I think they get bigger though. No, there's that sensor. Hold on, I got to type this in. I'll figure it out. The world's largest. Oh boy. Uh, camera sensor sensor let's see here loading <clears throat> images okay where'd you go where'd you go I saw this photo um, alright let me go to an actual article so I can read some details about this Canon develops the world largest hold on <laughs> where are we at that's no that's CMOS sensor that's not the biggest sensor the biggest one was made by NASA or something. Anyway, okay, so I'll just I'll tell you what I remember about uh, about viewing this image. There was I saw good gosh, that's huge. I saw a picture of a sensor sitting on the ta on a table that I think was maybe about the size of a dinner table. I forget the specifics, but it was an enormous. Sensor and for yeah, for you those of you who don't know what what I'm saying when I'm saying sensor is if you if you take a DSLR you take the lens off the front of it you see that that um you you flip up the mirror and you see that that rectangle in there that looks that got some Technicolor action going on kind of looks like a weird computer chip thing that's your sensor and so this sensor was enormous anyway that would be the best sensor to get if if bigger means better all the time. But I don't think that a larger sensor uh, is is better or worse. Sure, the larger the sensor, the more light it absorbs. But that's eh, that's that's a good thing. But it's really not that important if you're picking out a camera. Honestly, I would say that the way that we should think about sensors is that they are. Each one is different. Each one has its own characteristics. It's, it's its own aesthetic. It's like if you had if you had three children, one of them's a redheaded <clears throat> one redheaded soccer player. Second one is a half moose, half um, half uh, female woman, <laughs> human woman, with an elongated. Um, ear on the left side, that would be your APS-C, and then full frame would be um, <clears throat> a very handsome, handsome man who is who runs a business and raises venture capital. So you see here that there is a different aesthetic. <laughs> I go on, I go on rampages here. I'm like, <laughs> I surprise myself sometimes. Okay, so you see that there that there is an aesthetic difference between each one, and I, I would I would say that it would ju it would be good to learn that when you're picking out a camera, that you should learn what is the aesthetic properties of this sensor. Each one's just different. A Micro Four Thirds has a different look, has a different set of characteristics from an APS-C sensor or a full-frame sensor. There's nothing like a full-frame. You hear people say this all the time. But um, APS-Cs are fantastic, and they have their own look to them. I, we, I, when I shoot video um, on my vlogging camera or when I'm shooting video for my Red Photo channel, a lot of times I'm using a camera with an APS-C sensor. And it's a fine camera. It looks fantastic. It's got its own characteristics. Uh, Micro Four Thirds got, has a very unique, interesting look to it. And when you're picking out your sensors, remember that you're you're going to crop your lenses. So if you have an APS-C size sensor, you're going to crop <clears throat> you're going to crop I think 1.5 or six times. So basically, if you have a uh, 50 millimeter lens. <clears throat> that's going to end up being somewhere around uh was it 80 or so I think is that right or if you have a 35 millimeter lens that's going to come out to be about 50 millimeters uh if with uh, with uh, with a micro four thirds though it's double so you're going to come out with a 
Um, if you, if you have a 25 millimeter, you're going to come out with a 50, which is easier to calculate. It's <laughs> easier math in my head, but yeah. So I, I think w I, the way that I think we need to talk about cameras and gear in general is <clears throat> that it is a, is a tool for you to use and master the, the most effective way to use your your camera and your lens or lenses is to look at something that you want to take and you want to master and something that when you're buying it it meets your needs specifically to what you're trying to do right now for example <clears throat> i think the the single best camera i could buy would be a sony a7 cuz i love I, I do love full frame and my D600 is full frame, but it's a big DSLR, and uh, I'd like to upgrade to something that that is smaller and uh, something that can be more multifunctional. Whoopsies, broke something. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I would pick out an A7, but um, for some people, you know, I have a friend who loves to he he just kind of loves to photograph his journal his life. He's a, he's a very exquisite writer, and he loves to journal his life, take pictures of some food that he eats, and um, explore. He uses an Olympus OM-D, I believe, which is a you know a tiny little camera in comparison to to a uh, you know a DSLR or even a a Sony a, you know a six thousand or a five thousand. It's a tiny little camera, and <clears throat> that's perfect for him. It shoots great photos. It's fantastic. He shares on Instagram. It's fantastic. Uh, I have a, another friend who's a street photographer. He uses a, a Fuji camera. I have another friend who's a street photographer. <laughs> he uses a Fuji camera, APS-C, and that's it's a fantastic tool for them. So uh, you know, it's I mean, there throughout history, it's you will see that artists um, they're littered with people who who don't focus too much on the gear and they focus on using what either they have or at some point they decide to you know finally get upgrade to a place where they have the exact tool that they need and they they love that thing they adore that thing i i fall in love with my cameras man like <laughs> it's it's a special thing so yeah, treat treat them as as tools and um, treat them as as something that you would love to make an extension of your arm and of your brain. So I hope that was valuable today. That was just a little bit of ranting about uh, about gear and and what gear to buy and what gear to. It's okay if you do buy it because it, it's. You know, just work with whatever you have, and um, yeah. I hope I, I hope I spoke about this in a way that's a little bit different than what you're used to, uh, in terms of gear. I hope this was an interesting, inspiring thing to listen to. So anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. I was gonna say watching, listening, and uh, I am at James the Red on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Red Photo on YouTube. And I hope you guys have a lovely day. Goodbye.